El Salvador specifically, I think those reasons have and are changing. We went through a period of time where people were fleeing because they were fearing for their lives. Those dynamics have shifted and economic opportunity is a huge one. Family reunification is a huge one. There are a lot of El Salvadorans living in the United States who've lived there for a really long time and families want and need to be together. So that is another driver. We're live here from Bitcoin Beach with Angela Smith. And I'm super excited today because we're going to be talking about immigration. And I know for a lot of people that can be kind of a, a touchy issue. But for me, it's, it's touched so many different um, parts of my life, have, have interacted with basically worldwide immigration and the way the system is set up. And it's something that uh, I myself don't fit into a box. Usually there's you know, people on one side or another of this issue, but it's actually a very nuanced and messy issue. And so I wanted to discuss this, and especially in light of all the changes that are happening in El Salvador, uh, the adoption of Bitcoin and how I view that's going to transform the country and bring more job opportunities. And so I had put something out on the Facebook expats group of, hey, who who here in this community you know, has interacted with the immigration system and could kind of shed some light and help people understand um, the nuances of it, how broken the system is, the, the different drivers of it. And Angela uh, volunteered to, to come and take part. So uh, I don't know uh, her views on Bitcoin. We'll get into that a little bit here today. But she has been in the country for, uh, for a number of years in different capacities. So Angela, why don't you introduce yourself and tell the listeners a little bit about why you're here in El Salvador, and then we'll get more into the immigration issues. Okay, great. Well, thanks first for having me on, Mike. Um, I'm excited to be here. I uh, I can say that this is uh, this is my first podcast that's related to Bitcoin, um, but uh, I'm looking forward to talking about it more with you and learning a little bit. I hope. Um, I am a consultant, an independent consultant. I have a consultancy based in the United States called Chispa Strategies, uh, and the work that I'm doing actually. Has a gives a bit of a twist to what I had been doing previously. So I've done a lot of work in the area of immigration. I've led uh, refugee resettlement, immigrant child and family services. I have a background with children's rights um, and particularly focused on migration. Um, and I've also worked on this side of the border on development, um, working with communities to develop economic opportunities, entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship. And so I've seen and lived in the space of migration for a long time. Um, I've gotten to know the people uh, involved and I've gotten to know a lot of people working on both sides. Um, and when you talk about it being a touchy issue, it is obviously always a hot button issue and a very politically charged issue. Um, I fall in the same camp as you do. I think it's it's nuanced, it's complex. I think there are problems. Um, and I also think there are really human-centered reasons that we need to do a lot more work um, to make it better on on in all countries, yeah. not just uh, in the in the United States or El Salvador, Honduras, Guatemala, uh, Mexico. You know, so so I started on uh, consultancy. Um, mostly around the work of organizational strategy, culture. Um, one, of the, one of the really um, important things and one of the things that's brought this full circle for me has been the idea of um, the way our system works. Um, and I've had great relationships with the U.S. Embassy here in El Salvador. I've had great relationships um, with folks in the United States who are very anti-immigrant. Um, and I've also had great relationships in the US with people who um, are kind of where you are on the issue. Like, I, I don't like to talk much about it because it's a hard issue to talk about. 
So when I saw your post on on expats group, I thought, well, I, I could have that conversation. And I've been doing a lot of work around um, civil discourse in in recent years. So um, civil discourse and trying to really reach across um, political divides and try to talk about things that are hard to talk about. So when I saw your post, I thought that sounds like a fun conversation. And so here I am. My work may not be, you know, specifically with migration in the moment, but I am still working with other consultants on migration issues and you know, putting our feelers out for new programs and projects. So the, the work still goes on. It's just not my my main focus at the moment. Just just for a little background for for, for you, but also for the, the the viewers as we kind of talk into these things because and just acknowledging that they tend to be politically charged. And um, I, I actually think incorrectly because I think it's much more nuanced and I don't think it's the two camps like people think, but people would probably describe me as being, you know, more right wing conservative in my political views. Would you characterize yourself in any particular way on the political spectrum? Um, you know, I'm always told I shouldn't um, when I'm in in the consulting sector, but I do. Um, I would I would put myself um, probably left of center, uh, so not extreme left for sure, and not right. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'd give myself a I'd give myself a a solid left of center. That's kind of what I assumed with your your background and yeah. the work you, you kind of do. That kind of you know fits the the mold to to some extent. I so. move closer to the center as I get older. <laughs> well, I think as you get older, you realize you know the hard lines you had on things are a little more messy than you thought when you were young when you, when you knew it all. Um, right. Yeah. Right. So I miss I those days. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so or something. Uh, you know, very um, comforting about knowing that you were right and the other person was right, wrong. Right. So. Uh, what, what would you say is the, the biggest misconception people have a, about the immigration issue as like, what is the, the cause of it? And let's look before we look at the, the impacts in the, in the U S you know, focusing more on the root causes of it. What is it that causes people mm -hmm. to leave the country of their birth and move some place where they often don't speak the language, where they don't have the the network of family and friends, um, what would you see as kind of the main driver of that? Well, I think it's changed over time. And I think particularly if we're talking about the, the region we're in, Central America and El Salvador specifically, I think those reasons have and are changing. Um, we went through a period of time where people were fleeing because they were fearing for their lives. Uh, it's not to say that that doesn't still happen, um, but those dynamics have shifted um, and economic opportunity is a huge one, a huge driver of illegal or irregular migration to the United States. Um, family reunification is a huge one. There are a lot of El Salvadorans living in the United States who've lived there for a really long time and families want and need to be together. So uh, that is another driver. One of the big reasons that we have so much irregular migration is because there's not a good system uh, to allow people to freely move uh, to places where they want to move. Um, I moved to El Salvador uh, and it wasn't really hard at all to get residency here. Um, but for someone going to the United States, particularly from this region, it is very hard. Uh, and so, you know, when you don't have legal means to enter a country where you want to live or be with your family or seek a better life. Um, people tend to do what they need to do in desperate situations. So that's that's a comment you hear from people a lot of time, like people should do this legally. They should do it the right way. They shouldn't jump to the front of the line. You know, they're hurting the people that are trying to do it legally. We have a system for that. Um, as somebody who's helped a number of people through that system, I, I understand it's not that simple, but I would love to hear your take or your description to the people of what that system is like and why people choose to come illegally rather than kind of going through the system. Mm -hmm. Well, 
it's a really complex system and it's a really broken system. And we all know that as U.S. citizens, we're well aware of the broken immigration system and how it's been used as a political football for uh, decades. Um, and, you know, the causes that, that drive people to the United States and draw people to the United States are economic opportunity. And now I'm forgetting exactly what your well, question just, was. Well, just the, the why, why don't they come the legal way? Why, why, don't why they would they the be coming so, illegally? Because it's a hard system to, to break into. You don't, you can't just uh, show up at the U.S. Embassy and say, hey, I'd like I'd like a visa to go to the United States. Uh, you, there are a lot of hoops that you have to jump through. You have to demonstrate a lot of ways that you are going to be coming back. And there need to be um, rules in place for us to have orderly uh, migration, of course. But what we have is a way for people who have, uh, have means to get a visa, to go on vacation, those sorts of things. But in order to move to the United States or even go to the United States for opportunity, um, it's not so easy. And and particularly when we're talking about asylum and, and, and I'm talking about this more globally, uh, I ran a refugee resettlement program in the United States. Uh, there were people that we welcomed into our program that had been in refugee camps for 10 years or more children who were born there finally coming to the United States. So it's a slow process. It's a very bureaucratic process. Um, it's not an easy process to go through. And that's not to say that because it's not easy, you shouldn't go through a process, but the process needs to be a lot more uh, streamlined and fair, equitable. Uh, we have a right as, you, as, a, as a country, I think, to determine what our uh, rules are about immigration. Um, asylum is a right, a human right that uh, some people might disagree with me on, but it, when you're fleeing because you're persecuted, there's a right to claim asylum in another, in another country. Um, immigration is just, um, it's a complicated and complex system that we have in the United States, politically speaking and um, structurally speaking, that doesn't allow people to to make that move. Um, and movement, human movement is has always happened and it always will happen. And if we actually took the time to and had the political will to change our system, I think we could really benefit so when you the say countries on both sides yeah. of, of the immigration, piece. when you say change the system, do you mean to let more people in or just to change the process for who's able to to come in legally? Or what would what do you mean when you say change the system? Mm -hmm. We need comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and we've heard that term, that phrase for I don't even how, know how many years now. Um, but we need ways that people can come in legally. Not everybody wants to move to the United States and stay there. Some people are going really as a stopgap measure to make sure that their family survives for the next six months. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, there are farmers in the United States. There are labor shortages in certain sectors in the United States where um, people would happily go back and forth to be able to have those opportunities that we can't fill otherwise. Um, so I think that there are ways that countries have figured out how to make immigration uh, or migration easier, um, make immigration more accessible um, and more accessible to different levels of society. So. You know, sure, everyone wants their country to be full of scientists and doctors and and uh, people with higher level degrees. Um, but we also need the people who are willing to do the farm work that is too expensive and too complicated to do um, without hands and, and humans yeah. uh, doing that work. So I think, um, you know, Spain is an example of a circular migration program where, you know, for years with Morocco, they have welcomed in immigrants on visas to do farm work and then to go home. Uh, 
the country that the farm workers are coming from benefits from an influx of income. Um, and the country that is welcoming those immigrants is, is getting the work done that needs to be done. Um, there are a lot of nuances, yeah. like you said, about things like human rights and labor rights and how those are respected or not respected in countries. But I think if we, if we were to try to, uh, to move toward immigration reform in a meaningful way, um, there, there's a, there's a lot better way than what we're doing. Um, because, you know, building a wall is, is not going to stop people from trying to come to our country. Right now we've got a number of countries beyond, you know, a few years ago, we were just talking about Guatemala and Honduras and El Salvador. Uh, now we're talking about Venezuela and Cuba and Haiti. And, Haiti, yeah. Yeah, and, and Nicaragua. Um, you know, so the, and people coming from China and from Afghanistan and now Russia who are on our borders, uh, on, on the southern border of the United States and other borders of the United States trying to come in. So if we don't have uh, an immigration system that works, um, we're going to continue to have these crises um, and they don't have to be crises. Um, but in order to. So so for people you've helped go through the process, maybe just mm -hmm. describe for the, the listeners or the viewers what that looks like. How long mm -hmm. does this take? How much money are they looking mm -hmm. to spend? What is the, the steps they need to take to, mm -hmm. to try to enter legally? Well, entering legally, again, entering might not be possible for some people. Um, once you're there, if you're undocumented, and in my case, I've worked with refugees who come on a visa because they're refugees, um, and worked with children in child welfare who are undocumented. Um, and they have to go through a process to get special immigrant juvenile status, to use an example. Um, for a child to get special in immigrant juvenile status, the backlogs in our courts, and this is for a child, um, could take as long as, as three years, five years uh, for one child. I've seen that happen. Um, I've seen others who've come and claimed asylum once they're in the country or uh, tried to get their their green cards who've waited for five, 10 years. Um, our system is completely broken. It's backlogged. The courts are not able to keep up with the cases that there are. Um, and we have a number of people who are there on special visas legally, like TPS. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it, it, this, it, the system's overwhelmed. Um, and we've done nothing to try to fix it because it's too easy to use as political. Uh, yeah, and it's yeah. it's interesting too. Even on the political side, that is that is even where people stand have shifted at, at different times. The last time we saw real significant immigration reform done in the U.S., it was under Reagan, and at that time, it was more the left that was more anti-immigrant uh, because there was a sense of, you know, they would come in and compete with the, the union workers. And so it's, you've seen a little bit of that shift where now it would be more people on the right that would be more um, against seeing increased immigration on it. So I think even the, the, where the political will is over time has kind of shifted. shifted. So it's, it's mm -hmm. interesting to see how that works. I know for myself, my first exposure to people being in the U.S. illegally was as a young kid. We were we lived in a community in California where they grew avocados. We had avocados on our uh, it was a small ranch, I think 10 acres. And we had a Guatemalan family that was, you know, kind of overseeing that that lived in that on a trailer on, on the property. And I knew they were in the country illegally. They were working to get their their legal status. But. They were there illegally, but I also knew that the school district came out and was talking to the the you know parents saying, "Hey, your kids have to be in public school if you're here." And I remember as a young kid, that was I really wrestled with that. I'm like, this doesn't make sense. They're here, here illegally, like against the law for them to be here, but yet the law says they have to be in in school. And I think for somebody that was young, it was hard to bring those two together. Obviously, as you get older, you realize. The world's a very complicated 
place and situations are very complicated. And so it's hard to have like a right and wrong, um, you know, this is the right way to do it. This is a wrong way to do it. And that's why I think it's important for things like this, for people to kind of understand the nuances that, that go into that. Um, beyond that, I wound up in a, in a business, um, a seasonal food service business that's very reliant on uh, migrant labor, both legal and, and illegal. Um, that has changed some within the industry as they've cracked down on verifying social security numbers and that sort of thing. But it's, um, you know, a number of people through the H2B visa, I think it is, is the program that a lot of the people that, that come in. Um, we sponsored a, a, a Guatemalan a young man to, to come in, knew his family for a number of years. And he, you have to have a certain level of financial resources to serve as a sponsor. And his his family members couldn't do that because they were already sponsoring other people. And so there is technically some legal liability that if they apply for certain social services and you're their sponsor, you are the one that is supposed to, to reimburse the state for that. I, I think on a practical level, I don't think that ever happens. But um, so I've, I've had lots of interactions with the system prior to moving to El Salvador. And I would say in general, I feel like it's hard to criticize somebody that's trying to support and you know feed their family. It's just because they were born on one side of a you know, somewhat arbitrary line versus another um, that they have less opportunities. So for me, it kind of made sense that you know, these are people just trying to do their best. And I would say overall, you see within the country the, the benefit of it. You, know, you were mentioning earlier the price of food. So many of our industries kind of depend on that. I think after spending 10 years in El Salvador, my view is even more nuanced because I feel like immigration has negative, a lot of negative externalities on the countries that the immigrants are leaving from. Um, just the, the breakdown of a family structure, the, you know, just a lot of other things. So we can get more into details, but just a little, just want to give a brief kind of overview as kind of where I'm coming from in this. And so I've seen a number of people try to go through the system legally. And I think the, the biggest challenge is just the uncertainty in it. Like there's not a sense of if this is going to take six months or six years. And it's always kind of hanging out there like, okay, it's two more thousand dollars to your lawyer and then you have this next meeting. And so there's always this sense of they don't know, is this ever going to happen? And so I've seen people that are in the legal process and they, they kind of throw up their hands and, and decide to circumvent it. And then, you know, as luck would have it, that's when they get their appointment and they can't show up because they're already in the U.S. and it screws everything up. And so I think that's one thing for people to understand is just how convoluted the process is. And I think part of that is just, you know, anytime you're dealing with government, things can be bureaucratic. But I think partially it's by design, as this is a way to limit the number of people coming in legally is just the, you know, the slowness of the system and how slow the, the cogs are, you know, turning. Um, do you... Share that view, or why do you think it's such a messed up system? Well, I think the I think the the cogs are turning slowly. Yes, and I also think that the amount of uh, conflict and upheaval and uh, drivers of migration are changing and pushing people. Um, and 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 we've not set up a system that's capable of dealing with it. You know, we you know if we drive down the numbers of people who are. Uh, captured at the border than our administration is celebrating. Um, and that lasts for, you know, six months, a year, and then the numbers go up again. Um, why are the numbers going up? There's a lack of opportunity. And 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 I'm, I'm speaking to this region now because yeah. this is where we are. Um, there's a lack of opportunity. There are climate issues that are taking place, droughts, floods. Um, so a family farm gets flooded out or gets, you know, blown away because it's it's the it's a desert now um and, and what are the other options if those are your skills um there's not farm subsidy in el salvador like there is in the united states if you lose a crop you could lose your livelihood 
Um, so I, I think that um, I think it's a combination of things. And and that's why I was glad too, just to for you to have me on the program to have the conversation that says, why, why is this so complicated? It is. It's complicated. Yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about human beings and there are a, a million different reasons that a person might uh, travel to the United States, migrate to the United States or to another country. Um, most of the time it's out of desperation and not simply, you know, something I want to do for fun. Yeah. Um, or, you know, it seems like it'd be a great, you know, a great place. Uh, it's, it's usually out of desperation. Um, I, I push back on that a little bit because I feel like it is very, very mixed and I've seen it's very hard to put one aspect on it. Like what I've seen from the people who have left here in El Zante, there is a huge part of it was the fear of the gangs, mm -hmm. but it was also they heard they could get a job making a lot more. And so it's I don't even think they would be able to tell you what percent was one thing and what percent was the other. It's like the overall just like anything in life, it's the overall draw mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see immigration pick up to the U.S. when there's more jobs available in the U.S. That's that's a driver for people to to leave. You mm -hmm. also see when there's war, conflict, gang stuff, that's also pushing. And so I don't know how the asylum caseworkers make their determinations because I've seen people go through this process and the reality is they're coached along into what to specifically say during that. And a lot of it is kind of true, but not to the extent. And so I don't know. And obviously in other cases, they're they're really, you know, if they stay another month, they, they may be killed. And so I don't know how the asylum case where I would hate to be in that position. Like, how do you determine all these people that have this same story, which ones are telling the truth and which ones are lying or which ones is it's in between? Well, we make it, we don't, it, it's not as simple as, as a caseworker just hearing someone tell their story. Honestly, there is a lot of uh, proof that you have to bring to the table in order to, to win an yeah. asylum case. And it's very, very unlikely for most people that they'll win an asylum case, but it is, it is far more complicated than just explaining your story and being coached to tell you, I mean, you bring, newspaper articles and police reports and it's very difficult to get an asylum claim approved in the united states um and and you're right the the reasons are mixed um and it's kind of like poverty you know you it's a complex issue and so why don't you just pull yourself up by your bootstraps well because you know uh the engine died on my car last month and i lost my house and now i don't have any place to live um it's the same sort of thing with with immigration. There are there are reasons why people stay in poverty. Um, it's not everybody can pull themselves up by their bootstraps and make it make a go of it in El Salvador or yeah. Guatemala or Honduras. And so when you have a family of of ten um, and you're a eighteen year old young man who's at risk anyway of being recruited into the gangs and your family needs income, it's it's very appealing to go to the United States until you get there. And then I, I do know people here who've been to the United States and um, they've gone out of that kind of desperation. And it may not be desperation, somebody's going to kill me, but it may be desperation. I'm a single mom taking care of my two children and my parents now. Yeah. Uh, and I can't find a job in El Salvador. And so I'm going to go to the United States and I'm going to work uh, in a restaurant and live in an apartment with 10 other people um, and work 20 hour days and, you know, and be exploited. Um, and then I'll come back as soon as I have enough money to get through another job search round. Um, I mean, those stories are real and they're, they're people I know. Yeah. Um, so I think um, the complexity is is one that's, you know, it, it's right along the lines with human complexity. Um, nothing's as simple as it seems from the outside. Uh, we have, you know, the, the group in the United States who says, why can't they just come legally? Have you ever done, um, have you ever done a, a 
poverty simulation? No. I'd like to see migration or immigration uh, simulations done in ways that people could really see what, what it looks like. Yeah. I did a poverty simulation once um, several years ago, and it was a nonprofit that set, set up um, this, uh, essentially it was a big room, like a, an event space. Um, and we all were given a certain role um, everyone who signed up for this. And so you were, you know, you might be a single mom, you might be a single dad, you might be uh, a 25 year old young man, you might be um, a teen mom. Anyway, you had to go through um, basically a month with the, with the, the narrative of what it looks like to be to live in poverty and how hard it is to get out and the systems that are in place that are so bureaucratic yeah. um, and keep I mean, you locked in. and keep you locked in. Uh, and I think that, you know, with immigration and it's very much related to poverty, um, you're looking at the same thing. The system's the same. I mean, you, you, if you go to the United States and this is a, an issue or a situation that I dealt with when I was working with migrant families, um, you know, a family here whose son was uh, captured and on the border and in a, a detention facility. Um, the family didn't know how to get a hold of him. Um, they didn't know how to get a lawyer for him. Um, they couldn't figure out how to make sure that he was safe. Um, and so they started calling the de detention center where he had called from. But everything's in English. Yeah. And so they couldn't get any information because if they didn't speak English, um, they didn't even know how to help their son get home if that was the, what the plan was to do. Um, and so we set up the system in a way that really is just a catch-22 for people. Um, people can get moved from detention center to detention center and families don't know because they're you know, in another country and they don't speak our language or the language that we use for the system that's in place. And so, you know, when you say, how is it messed up? It's messed up in ways like that. Um, you know, I, I know someone who, uh, who came here, who's on TPS in the United States and came here on what they call parole. They give you a parole and you can travel back to your country for a certain length of time. Um, but those documents came to him in English and he speaks a little English, but they're documents yeah. and they can be complicated. And uh, and he ended up um, overstaying and he didn't even know that he had overstayed until he arrived at the airport. Um, and and then he couldn't get back in. You know, so we, we've set up the system in a way that um, makes it very difficult to follow rules um, and very difficult to um, to be able to access the the the, op the option. Um. So, so going back to the, the asylum question, I mean, do you think it's just, it's just a messy issue and it's always going to be messy and, and they're doing the best that they can? Do you think there's a better way? Because the other thing that, that I've seen is, is it's, it's very much abused because it's known that if you go and claim asylum when you show up at the border, that then they will release you and that a lot of people never show up for their asylum hearings after that. That's just their way of getting into the US rather than actually trying to physically sneak across the border and be in, is just to turn themselves in. Um, and, I, and I know this because I've talked to several people from here that have done that. They tell me that's my plan. This is what I'm going to do. Um, you know, there was the time where, if you, especially if you had a child with you, that was even more advantageous because by law, they could only hold the children for, I think it was 10 days um, in a facility. And after that, they had to release, release them. To them. A relative and or to a, yeah. And a lot of times there wasn't a relative. And so, you know, initially that was the, the parent that was with them would get released also. That was, you know, that was at least put on hold for a while. I knew somebody who went during that time and she wound up being detained because they were no longer doing the, you know, what, what people would pejoratively call the catch and release. Um, and she wound up in facility for a year. And it was a very, very sad situation apart from, from her daughter. 
and you know just just heartbreaking and but it's I wrestle with it because I'm like, well, what what is the solution? Because I I know that was, I mean, I've sat with these people. They'll they'll tell you this is the plan. This is what we're going to do, and this is what we're being told by the coyotes is that you do, and this is the system. So there's a system set up to try to bring people in who have really have their lives in danger. But how, how do you make that determination, and how do you? I don't, I'd say that as somebody who I don't know. I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but I'm curious if you have thoughts on that. Well, I definitely don't have the solution. I wish I did um, because I think it's a tragic thing when people uh, apply for asylum and are denied, especially when it is a situation that deserves an asylum. Um, you know, I think... But, but do you think... Do I think people do you use think it that, as a, that we have the capability to grant asylum to every? Buddy who's in that that situation, like it's it's I'm assuming there this would be tens of millions of people in the world. And so how, how do we just from like a realistic capacity? Well, asylum status, has very strict guidelines. Um, so you're not you you don't get asylum because um, you know you're you have you have you have to be in physical danger persecuted for specific reasons um, but, but that's something that's very you know especially for people from el salvador that was very easy because almost everybody was being extorted and, but they had to prove and, it and it's very hard to prove yeah um so you know if you if you just show up at the border and say you know i'm claiming asylum and it's because i had a pupuseria and I was being charged rent and I couldn't pay the rent. And so the gang said that they were going to, you know, take my daughter, whatever. I'm, you know, making this story yeah. up. Um, Which was a very common reality. Yes, it was yeah. a very common reality. OK, so what's your proof? Did you report it to the police? Well, no, people weren't reporting it to the police. Why? Why because were they not? A lot of times they're involved in it. Because they, yeah. because there were there was police involvement. So, you know, there they couldn't you can't just get in. I think it's a misconception yeah. that uh, asylum can be so misused because you do have to go through a lot of really difficult um, steps to to be able to be but you're, awarded. You're talking asylum. about actually being awarded asylum. asylum. Yes. But to claim asylum and be released is a very much lower bar. But that's not happening anymore. I, I don't know. I don't know in the last year, but I know historically because I, I would hear from lots of people that was the route that they would go. I'm going to claim asylum at the border. They're going to release me, and then I just don't show up to my meeting. You know, my hearing. Yeah, and now we have and Title I, 42 that's still in place at least in, until May 11th, I think, or something like that. And that's where they have to stay in Mexico. They have to stay in Mexico. Yeah, um, and you know, will that be extended? Uh, what will that look like if it's not extended? And there's it a lot of criticism of that. Yes, of absolutely. that program because there there are a lot of people suffering on the Mexico side of the border. Yeah. Mexico side of the border is suffering from having such an influx of of people. Um, you know, it's uh, it's it's not working. Um, there are times. But, but how do you what? So what's the solution then? And I say this is. It's just generally they want to know, like, how do you allow people to come in and the, the generally are fearful of their life, but also know that's so difficult for people to tell. And, and historically, people very much were abusing that system. I mean, I I know this not just secondhand. I mean, I know p literally people that worked for me here that said, mm -hmm. I'm going to the U.S. and this is my plan. Mm -hmm. And so I and they said, this is what everybody does. So it was being it was definitely being abused. Mm -hmm. So and, and not expecting you to have the answer, but I'm just kind of curious because I don't I've never heard anybody say what the solution is. And you no, know, and it's it's to say that comprehend it's comprehensive. What's the solution? It's comprehensive. We have to make sure that we are um, utilizing our resources wisely and really strategically uh, aligning with other countries to say, OK, what what can we do to help improve development so we can reduce yeah, uh, migration, creating opportunities that benefit. And, and we all know if if the U.S. is businesses are coming into a country, it's it's business interests. Right. Um, we have to make sure at the same time that people are being treated, their human rights are being respected. Um, 
So, you know, opportunities need to be created in countries where there aren't opportunities or people are going to come for jobs. Safety needs to be created in countries where there isn't safety or they're going to migrate yeah. for their lives. Yeah. Um, you know, and we have to have court systems that are set up to be able to to see all of those cases, to hear all of those cases. Um, or we have to have a better filtration system. Um, there are lots of things that are happening right now um, that are being tried um, that aren't necessarily working either. We, we've got to we've got to set up a system in which we're investing enough in development. We are investing enough in the way we filter at the border. And it can't just be for asylum cases that we want that to work. We need to create policy that allows people to move freely uh, for purposes, yeah, economic purposes, uh, family purposes. Um, those 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 policies just aren't in place. Uh, there are, are family members here who can't visit their family members in the United States because they don't own property or they don't have a bank account. And because we're afraid they might stay, and they might. Um, so you know, what's the solution? I, I wish, I yeah. wish anybody had the solution. I think if anybody did have the solution, uh, we'd live in a much happier, more peaceful world. But you know, there are people working every day to try and create the solution. It's a long-term problem. It's not intractable. It's it's one that we can solve, um, but it's going to take respecting human rights and having humanity, um, not implementing the cruelest pol policies possible because they're the easiest. Uh, it's going to be um, creating systems internally that allow people to apply for and be granted uh, visas that can uh, meet needs that we have in the United States. Um, so it, it's, an, it's a number of things, um, education, investment in education. We need to work in the countries with countries so that they uh, can develop, walk alongside countries so that they can develop their education systems and their their business infrastructure and um, physical infrastructure yeah. so businesses will come. So it's a, it's a number of different um, approaches that have to happen at the same time, which is why we say comprehensive immigration reform. It can't be one thing that that is the answer. So we'll, we'll delve a little bit more into the the you know positive things that can keep people in country, the economic development. I want to focus on that on the, the latter half. But before we get to that, do you. I mean, I, I think everybody would agree that the current system is is broken, that it should be something that's more straightforward. This is what you have to do. You find out whether or not you qualify in a timely manner, not having to wait years to figure out if this is going to actually happen. Do you think that we should increase the number of people that we allow into the country? Do you think that that's one of the issues or do you think it's more just the way that the systems run or do you, what's your I definitely view on that? think we need to increase the number of people that we permit into the country. And I think there are a lot of reasons for that. One, because there are a lot of people who are without uh, an alternative at this point. There are millions of people uh, in refugee camps around the world. So I think, yes, definitely we need to increase that cap. Um, but I think we need to do it in a way that we can also um, provide the, the services and the capacity, capacity building yeah. um, that allow people to fill, for example, jobs that we can't fill, um, you know, there are a lot of we talked we talked about agriculture as one of the industries. Um, you know, there are all kinds of industries across the United States and um, hospitality um, where we have gaps and we don't have people to fill the jobs. Our population in the United States is aging. Um, and so we don't we're not going to have enough people to fill jobs. So we could be educating uh, in in countries that do have the populations that then need those opportunities uh, so that they, they can fill those jobs, for example. Um, 
you know, STEM is really important right now. And I know everybody wants to attract STEM if they're going to open slots for immigration. Let's do it for, you know, high dollar workers. But we can't forget that we also have lettuce that needs to yeah. be, you know, harvested um, and that we can't fill those jobs. Not only do we not have the people who will and want to do those jobs, but we don't have enough people in the United States to fill the jobs that we need to fill in order to make our economy work. Yeah, no, and I know from personal experience, there's a, a number of those jobs just Americans just don't don't want to do. They're they're not going to take. And um, even the the food industry that that I came from, you know, a lot of businesses relied on the H two B visas for for seasonal workers to to come in, really from all around the world. Um, and it, but like all the programs, it was a bureaucratic nightmare. I mean, you had to post the jobs first, prove mm -hmm. that there was no, you know, Americans that wanted them. And it was, you know, it was just drawn out process. And so, mm -hmm. and there was caps every year and you never knew if you were going to get your people or not. And it's, it, it seems like, I don't know, the government always likes to make things the most complicated they, they can in those programs. But I don't know if you're familiar with, with that program at all, but I think El Salvador is, is sending a lot of people under the H-2B visa more I recently. Mean, I don't I know if that was something that changed on the yeah, governmental level to, or? It is. Um, actually, there's a, and there's, there are a couple of different programs that are, um, that are happening right now. And I've heard people here say, I, like I said, I have not kept up as much as I used to. Right now, uh, the H-2A program is allowing, uh, is the A no, for agriculture workers? Agriculture. Or okay, yeah. Um, and they're, I think it's for agriculture. Um, and and that's, this is, this is why it becomes complicated. So you have these programs that we're creating or that we have created that allow people into the United States. And then, um, so for example, if you are recruited by, um, by a, a a farmer or a business owner, a ag company, um, to go to work in the United States under one of the under this program, um, and you are required to stay with that employer. So, if that employer is abusing you, or you you don't have an option, if you leave that job, you lose your visa at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Then you're undocumented. So, um, you know, so we're having problems with these kinds of visas as well. Um, and so you say, what's the answer? And I say, my gosh, I wish we had answers for these things. And, and we're starting to, you know, so there, there've been prosecutions of, uh, of, um, companies. I think there were six in Georgia and Florida in the last year of, um, of companies who were using the, the H1A visa who hired people, you know, they used, they, they, the people were essentially forced labor because they had to pay a lot of money um, to be recruited. And then, you know, their passports were taken away. There were incidents of human trafficking. So it's it's yeah. complicated on, on that end, too. We need more programs like that. And then we need to be able to monitor those programs. You know, I have um, I have. You, you asked me at the beginning of the program where I would consider myself on the political spectrum, and I said I'm more center left. And I have family members who are far right, um, in 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 my view, um, and we have to have these conversations, um, and they're not always they're not always pleasant. Um, but we're not going to get to those answers until people like us can sit down and talk and say, okay, so what are the answers? And I do think that development work is important. Um, I think not just economic development, but social development, um, political systems development, uh, all of those things have to happen in order for there to be structures and systems in place so that people can thrive where they are. Um, education systems have to be bolstered. Uh, and then, you know, we have the, well, we can't do everything. And that's yeah. true. We can't do everything. Um, but there are a lot of countries around the world um who can cooperate to do things together and, and we're just not doing that right now not the not not to the 
to the lengths that we need to be doing that. Um, I mentioned that, uh, that I kind of moved from the NGO space, which is doing some awesome work when it comes to immigration and, um, uh, and protecting people's human rights. And, uh, right here in El Salvador, I, you know, I've, I've, I've worked with a lot of these organizations and people who could speak to the immigration issue much more eloquently than I could. Um, but I, uh, I started my consulting company and I was working on in, in my, in my non-work life, working on, um, on issues of colonialism, for example, um, and how, how we still today have somewhat of a colonialist mindset when we do development in countries. Um, so, so e extrapolate on that a little bit, expand what, what you mean by that. Well, when we when we go into countries and we do projects, um, project work that doesn't um, create sustainable change, um, I look at that as as uh, as a, a colonial a colonial mindset. You know, we when, we're going to help when you. Say you we, we're going to take care of you. Are you you talking about like USAID, IMF? NGOs, what what are you? I would not mention any of the above just because I'm I'm not I'm not criticizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I mean, just to, just to understand what we're what yeah, we're talking what about. What I'm saying is, um, when we do development work, we should be doing development work in a way that when our program ends or our project ends, people are not only better off, but that it's sustainable. That they can continue to be better off because of those programs and projects. I worked in that space for a long time. I will continue to work in that space um, whenever those opportunities arrive. Uh, recently, I have done a, a bit of a pivot and I've done some work with um, with a university in the United States recently. I am now working with a business here in El Salvador um, on leadership development, culture building within the organization and with and with the owner of that company. We had a really great conversation about how um, you know, we talk, we talk about, and when I say we, I'm talking about in the U S we talk a lot, a lot about, um, post-colonialism about, um, how we, we want to move in that direction. Um, and the owner of, of the company that I'm working with right now brought up the fact that colonialism exists right here in El Salvador. So, you know, when you're when you're trying to um, create equitable systems um, and systems that respect um, human beings and you try to shift culture, um, which is the kind of work that I'm doing now is cultural transformation kind of work within organizations and businesses. When you try to shift that and you come up against the same issues uh, in the countries where you're working, it becomes a really complicated um, scenario. Uh, but I look at it too as development can, work. Can you, without getting too specific, can you give an example just so we have a little bit of context of what? what Why would be an is issue it colonialist? What would, well, what, it, we what, still like, have what's a very, an issue that you're talking about? You so know? in in El Salvador, and I've worked with Salvadorans for a long time. In El Salvador, there's still very much a hierarchy type uh, structure yeah. when you're when you're talking about the workforce and workplace. So. Um, I've I've worked with business owners who've said I I just can't get things done because uh, without just telling people what to do because there's no, they're not empowered to do the things but it takes 100%. It takes yes. So so it takes uh capacity building and leadership development and and not just um not just from the top and not just from the bottom. I think I think there's a whole um, field of work that needs to be done in terms of development that helps um, that helps dismantle colonialist systems wherever they are, wherever they exist, um, because countries like El Salvador can and are developing, and the more empowered people become at the at the at the bottom levels of society. Uh, the more people we're going to have who can build the infrastructure and the economy and the the environment that we all want to live in um, here in El Salvador. Yeah. 
hundred uh, percent. And I want to, I want to actually dig into that, but, but there's a couple other things I just want to touch on briefly that I think it's important for people to hear and think about. Um, one thing you hear from, from people, specifically people on the right would be saying that people come to the United States illegally <clears throat> because they are drawn to the social benefits that are that are there they're coming for the food stamps for the you know the the government housing for the free health care for those sorts of things that's what's motivating them to go um how, how would you respond to that that they don't qualify if they're if they're undocumented in the united states they don't qualify for those benefits free education children go, go to school um that's a children's yeah. right yeah uh, and that's true in every country in the world. So education in the public school system, yes. Um, healthcare, do you want to go to the emergency room every time you're sick? Probably not. But food stamps? I, I mean, I push back on you a little even... bit. That, that, that happens. It is it's a very huge issue. I mean, living in California, you go to the emergency room. It is chock full of people that have a cold or something that I would never dream of going to the emergency room for because they're gonna go and they're not gonna pay their bill. And for them, waiting in line for six hours is they're used to that in life and it's not. So I do think we have to be realistic that there are some of those things that, that happen, that there's those complicated um, issues that happen. I would, I would push back that I don't think people go there for 100%. that purpose. No. Uh, like to get- You could do that here. Say, yeah, yeah, you could do that here. Yeah. Um, but I, I you know, I think that uh, I think it's a miscon misconception that uh, undocumented immigrants in the United States take advantage of our of our social systems, and that's why they go there to get free stuff. I think that's a huge mis misconception. No, I 100 percent agree. And I, and I think also they pay generally pay into our social security system, for example, uh, for years and years and years sometimes, and they never get a dime of that back taxes are taken out of their paychecks and they never get that back. So they're, yeah. you know, they're the, the ones that are working illegally that are working under somebody else's name or somebody else's social security number. The ones that are there legally and have that, they, they will qualify for those benefits. If, but they're, if, if, they're, yeah. if they're documented. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. No, I, I, and that's something I always push back on people. That's not, you're not going to leave your family and your friends and your network and, a country to go get government benefits someplace where, you know, even in El Salvador, there is free health care to, to some extent. You know, it's not that's not the motivation, especially for an 18 year old, 19 year old boy. That's not what the reason that they're going. They're going to work. I mean, that is the motivation. That's not to say that there are not some vested interest in groups that benefit from from swelling their enrollees in certain programs and, and target certain communities to try to increase the uh, enrollment um, because that's something I've seen in California that, that does happen. But it's it's definitely not the motivating factor. They're there to work. And and I think you alluded to it earlier. The reality is most of the time they're living in poorer conditions in the U.S. than they are in El Salvador or Guatemala or wherever they're coming from. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of times they're stacked in an apartment with 10 people, you know, eating food that's not nearly as delicious as what they'd be eating at home and working, you know, two jobs and to send money sending back. money home. Yeah. So it's um, I think I think a lot of times people don't think that when they're when they're leaving, they think they're going to be living this high life. Right. But it's not the reality. Part of that, I think, is perpetuated by social media is when people do go. They take pictures when they're at Disneyland or this and that and kind of, you know, like all human beings, people want to portray that their life's much better than it is. Right. And so I think a lot of times people think that's the reality, but the reality is life's usually pretty hard for people that are in mm -hmm. that position and they are doing the jobs that nobody else wants to do. So yeah. um, I think that's a misconception that that they're going there to benefit from mm -hmm. from government programs. That's not motivating you to risk your life to go to the US. Right, right. I do feel like um, it's important to to circle and, and I, I want to learn about I want to learn some more about Bitcoin from you on on from that side of the table, but um, on the development side of things, which I think is a huge part of 
the solution. Um, I think we have just to to really reevaluate how development is done. I think that's happening to a certain extent right now be, because it's we're being forced to reevaluate it. Yeah. Um, but I think that that is more of a key than uh, than tighter border restrictions, frankly. Um, I think if people had the opportunities, um, and not just job opportunities, not just low level minimum wage, because minimum wage doesn't, you know, when minimum wage doesn't get you by yeah. in El Salvador, um, but real opportunities to grow um, professionally and educationally. Um, there's a real desire, a real hunger for that in El Salvador. I, I've seen it. Um, and it's what it's what I'm working on right now, um, and I'm doing it from the from the perspective that um, development work doesn't always have to be uh, in in nonprofit. Yeah, the development work can happen in the for profit space as well, um, and and that's by building leadership skills. Uh, culture that uh, starts to lead people into the ability to hire, to into higher jobs, into higher level jobs where they are. Um, I see that hunger in people, and I see it uh, across the spectrum. People want to prosper; they want their children to prosper. Um, so I think we can, I think we can do a lot to solve immigration issues by investing in development and that can that doesn't have to be government yeah uh, investment i think that's another misconception is that it all has to be government funded um i think businesses would do well to invest in that kind of development the kind that uh, focuses on quality and efficiency and effectiveness in in the workplace um because when your business has people who are happy and well taken care of, businesses do better financially. So I think if we could look at development work uh, through more than one lens and not rely wholly on government funds um, and even you know international multilateral funding yeah. programs, I think um, I think sustainability requires that we look at it from all all perspectives and that that there's a real place for business and social development as well. So I personally believe that the the adoption of Bitcoin in El Salvador and the opportunities that are going to come with that are going to in themselves solve a lot of the, the immigration issues. And we'll, um, we'll we'll dive a little deeper into that. But before that, I'm just curious as to what your understanding of Bitcoin is, what your take on Bitcoin is. Um, I would assume it would be negative just because of the rest of your background, but uh, but I don't want to jump to conclusions. So yeah, I would like you know, to hear your your take. I would say that I I don't have I don't I'm not I'm not anti Bitcoin. Um, that might be surprising, um, but I don't have a thorough understanding of how it works. Um, I have concerns about um, what I what I do understand about how it works, which is you know it's a, a monetary system in which people can uh, their money can their val the value of their money can increase the or volatility decrease. the of volatility it. Yeah. of it. Um, I think could be really hard for people who have very little. Um, so I think inclusion in, in the Bitcoin world, and, that, and this, is, this is a very uneducated opinion about Bitcoin. Um, it's just one that I'm saying, you know, how do we include people in Bitcoin who can't afford to lose 10% yeah, tomorrow? Yeah. Um, so that's something, you know, I, I was glad when you put this out there, and I'm going to learn something about Bitcoin while I'm here too. But uh, I'm interested to hear how you can see it having an impact on on irregular immigration. Well, I think part of it is is understanding how the the 
global financial system works and how how much it's skewed towards those who who make the rules, which is primarily the United States, Europe to some extent. But uh, the dollar system is very much um, designed in a way that the U.S. can print money and use that money to buy goods and services from around the rest of the world. And so in a way, it's kind of a modern day colonialism. I mean, they're, they're basically drawing from other places with a currency that they can just print by flipping on a, a switch. And so it, but because they, they make the rules, they also can put regulations and different things in place that I, I don't think a lot of times they're actually trying to have a negative impact. But one thing I've seen in El Salvador is the, the KYC or know your customer um, or an AML, anti-money laundering laws that, that are put in place have created a lot of friction in the economy in El Salvador and keep a lot of people out of the banking system. That's why there's still majority of the people in El Salvador don't have bank accounts. It's not that they can't have bank accounts and most of them actually do have ID, especially in El Salvador, the, the, it's the majority of the people have their Deweys. Mm -hmm. um, but the financial regulations that are in place make it unprofitable for the banks to bank most of the people. They just will never, the compliance costs they have on their end are always going to be higher than any profits they'll be able to generate from these people. And so the as that works itself out in reality, you just find people are unbanked and they rely on informal systems to send money to, to cash checks. I mean, I have employees in the U.S. that still go to check cashing places that charge them 2% rather than a bank account because they said, no, by the time they get hit with all these fees and all these different things, they, they're better off just paying their 2% for the, the check cashing thing. Where I know for myself, you know, I get points for this and use it for airline miles and I'm a beneficiary of this system where, um, you know, people on on the lower end of the economic scale are usually the ones that pay the highest fees and the highest prices. And so um, Bitcoin is something that kind of blows that all up because nobody controls it. The US government can't control it. Nobody can control it. And it levels the playing field. So whether you're poor or rich, you have the same rights, you have the same access. There's no gatekeepers. There's not, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had experience of your bank freezing your account or, or putting a hold on something, it's really not your money. You don't control it. They, you have to get permission from them to use that. Where with Bitcoin, it's what we call a permissionless system where you don't need to have that. So somebody that's in the US legally or illegally can send money home to their family here without having to go through one of the gatekeepers or part of the system. And so, um, on one hand, it just opens up all these opportunities and levels the, the playing field. But it also, I, as, as somebody who has done financial deals here, done different things, there's a lot of friction in the system. And I've seen businesses say, the banks here are just so, I mean, I don't know if you have a bank account here, but it, their banks are horrible to deal with here. I won't put you on the spot, but I'll tell you, that's been my experience. And so it puts all this friction in and, and I've had people that want to open companies here and they're like, it's too hard to get anything done because we spend all our time trying to get wires cleared or this to happen. And so forget it, we're going to go somewhere else where Bitcoin offers this parallel system where you don't have to rely on the banks anymore. And, and it will get to the point where the banks now have to compete. And so they have to offer better um, customer service and, and do a better job than people can, you know, or people can turn to this alternative. And so for me, that's been one of the main drivers is, is we were doing a number of economic development programs in here in El Zante, specifically targeted to young people that were in danger of, of joining the gangs. That was, you know, El Zante was not exempt like everywhere. Um, that was a path that a lot of the young people chose to take. And, 
it wasn't necessarily they made like a ton of money being in the gang. They're still living in poverty, but they had this sense of like, now people have to respect me. They, they have to have, um, you know, people will know who I am. People won't talk down to me. And so it was a sense of, I think for a lot of them, it was a sense of belonging and they felt, well, I'm not going to make it in school. I'm not going to make it in this dead end job. And so I'd rather just join the gang. And a lot of them were growing up without their parents around mm -hmm. because their parents were in the U.S. working. And so you had a lot of um, kids growing up without specifically their fathers, but oftentimes their mothers, too, not around. And so I think it just made them easier prey for for the gangs because they wanted that sense of, of belonging. And so we started working with the youth and trying to figure out how can we get them to start thinking longer term to put value on education. Um, and the thing you quickly ran into was why bother going to school? Because there's no extra job opportunities. I'm still going to wind up, you know, in this dead end job, working someplace for minimum wage. There's not that much value to go to school. And so, you know, all these things, it's kind of a chicken and the egg and a catch 22. You can't have an economy grow without an educated populace, but people don't have the incentive to increase their education unless they feel like there's a payoff for that. And so as we started uh, paying young people in Bitcoin to clean the river, to um, we were given stipends for their grades in their class. If they got certain grades in their class, they would get a stipend payment in Bitcoin. We initially just saw this as another way that we can, you know, an alternative payment system that we can use for them that it doesn't matter if they're 18, it doesn't matter if they have documentation, they can still use this system. But what we saw as we started paying them, they started questioning for the first time in their life, what is money? Like, what is, what is this Bitcoin? How is it money? And then that leads to the question is, well, what is money? And that's a question that even many Americans never think to, you know, dive into it. And then it's like, well, it's these dollar bills. It's like, well, okay, why are you willing to exchange a house or a car or your time for these pieces of paper? And, you know, obviously, I don't want to get too far into the weeds with, with that. That's, a, you know, it's a, a multi-week course there. But the, the short version is, Money is your storm, your, your stored time and value. You've traded your time and your effort for something that you can get something that later down the road you can exchange for something else. And in the U.S., we have lots of opportunities of how to use that money to, you know, invest in things that will go up in value over time. We can, you know, have our, our 401k in the stock market. There's, you know other ways that, that you can in, invest. You can get a loan on a house that you know that you can leverage your money to to buy real estate. There's those sorts of things. But in El Salvador, there's very few of those options for people. They don't have opportunities to invest in the stock market. Property is accessible for some, but it's it's very difficult because it's hard to get a loan. And so unless you have the cash to to buy it. And so you'll see people store money in block. They'll buy extra block because they know they want to eventually build an extra room, but they know the cost of block is going to go up over time. And so they're better off buying the block now and, and just storing it in block. Um, but that's that's not something that's real like motivating to make you want to save for the future. And so we saw for these young people when they were able to engage in this global financial system that connected them to the people around the world, and they were to see over time, it was going up in value versus the dollar with lots of volatility along the way. It got them questioning for the first time, should I spend this now or should I save it for the future when if things, if history holds, it will buy me more. And it got them for the first time to start thinking about the opportunity cost of, of spending now versus saving for the future. And we saw a lot of carryover even into education where they started thinking for the first time, okay, if I'm willing to save my money for the future because I know it's going to return more in the future, 
why not invest in myself with my education and increase these these job opportunities as they're starting to see the, you know, the, and obviously I'm gonna have a biased view, but as they see the excitement about El Salvador, they see the flood of foreigners, you know, coming into El Salvador as tourists, as investors, um, as they see Bitcoin companies start to set up headquarters here that drives their vision and their feeling of what is possible in El Salvador, how they can build a life for themselves here versus having to try to go to the US illegally. And it's open to them. There's no gatekeepers there. Anybody can have a, a Bitcoin wallet. There's no approval you have to get. There's nobody that can tell you you can't. And so it's a, I would say it's a very counter colonial system where for the first time there's a system that no world power controls. I don't know if that makes sense at all. I mean, it's well, I, I mean, it's it's a lot, um, and I'm sure that there's a lot more, a lot a, mo a lot more detail that you could provide. And and I'm I'm not I guess I'm not clear on how you see it as a deterrent to irregular migration. Is it the the excitement about where they are now, um, or? and the opportunity that that builds that will reduce migration, um, or at least irregular migration. Um, it's it's a combination it's of things. So one is it allows them to work in the global economy because that's one thing that holds people back from hiring contractors overseas is just the challenge of actually being able to get money to them. And so now we're seeing people working for countries in Europe or companies in Europe or, or the US because it's easy for the company to pay them in Bitcoin. They don't have to go through the traditional system and the hassle of trying to get money to them. There's also a number of micro tasks that people can do where they're just earning a couple dollars for doing you know, little things on different platforms to people and they can receive that payment in Bitcoin through the Lightning Network that's virtually free versus mm -hmm. the traditional system that made that costly and cumbersome. So that's mm -hmm. that's one aspect of it. But also it's just opening this view that, wow, I can work and become a coder here in El Salvador and earn this salary that's more than I could ever dream of, even if I went to the US you know, to work in a restaurant. Now they're seeing companies come in, mentors, people that are doing that, those sorts of things. We're, we're still early stages, but it's, mm -hmm. it's connecting them, those, those pipelines and those mentors and those networks where they can see that it will be possible. And you've had, I think already, I think close to a hundred companies that have come in and established um, actual physical locations here because of the Bitcoin adoption and, and I, I personally think we're in the early waves of that. So you have these real opportunities coming in. And then also, you know, specifically in this zone, we've seen a huge increase in tourism. And so there's been a blossoming of tourist businesses that are basically focused on, on Bitcoin tourists that, that are coming in. And so it, it opens up a lot of practical opportunities, but it also has done a lot to just counter that negative mindset that existed here before, that El Salvador is a bad place and the U.S. is a good place and I need to do whatever I can to get there. I think now there's a sense of pride of, wow, this is a place that everybody in the world knows about now and there's all these foreigners coming here. Maybe it's worth staying here and participating in the economy. Okay. I sense skepticism from your part. No, so. it's not skepticism. It's it's honest. Um, it's processing. It's because because my my goal um, in being here uh, one is just because it's been it's become my my second home, um, and the people that I know and love here want to do well for themselves. So, you know, I'm I'm open to to thinking differently. Uh, about how that might happen. Um, so you're, you're seeing me processing. Uh, so if, for example, um, Bitcoin opens up the world economy in a way that Salvadoran, Salvadorans can be trained to do coding 
or whatever STEM related or what other kinds of jobs could Salvadorans do from here that they're getting paid in Bitcoin? And then my question would be, how does that, um, because Bitcoin is not controlled by anyone. Um, and maybe, and maybe that is my, you know, my big liberal fear is it's not controlled by anybody. So how do you know? The government doesn't run it. How do you know somebody's not just going to take it from you? But yeah. you could argue back then. How do you know the government's not going to take it from you? So, but anyway, my, my question is then, you know, how does that work within the, you know, millions, not millions, all of the, the hundreds of banking systems that exist or the, you know, however many banking systems exist across the country or across the world um, with taxation and that sort of thing. So if I'm in El Salvador uh -huh. and, and I'm uh, working in and working for a European company who's paying me in Bitcoin and Salvadoran government, well, Bitcoin is so say we're in Honduras and this is yeah. happening and yeah. they haven't adopted Bitcoin. So how how is that tracked in a way that um, that taxes can be that you can be taxed on it? Or do, do people just stop being taxed on on these dollars that are coming in from different parts of the world? Yeah. So it's it doesn't change people's tax obligations. You, you could say that they're going to be less likely to to pay taxes on those because um, it's not coming through the, the traditional system. But the reality is that it's not that much different than than cash. I mean, it's very mm -hmm. similar to, to cash. And so um, governments always find a way to get their portion. And so they will I don't think it will have any um, real direct um, limitations on the government being able to collect enough revenue to finance the, you know, things that the government needs to provide. It may shift the way that they do it. But the problem is now, like, like you look at the US, they passed, I think it was in 2014 or 13, the FACTA law. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's uh, uh, basically wanting to know any Americans overseas, if you have more than $10,000 in combined bank accounts that you have signing ability for, you have to file this form with the government. The bank is actually supposed to supply the US government with this information also. Um, they predicted it was gonna raise you know, some crazy amount of money. What it did was made banks and companies not wanna deal with Americans because they're like the compliance cost of doing this versus um, the money we can make from this person as a customer, it's, it's easier just to say, no, we don't bank Americans. We don't deal with mm -hmm, Americans. Mm -hmm. And so you see a lot of things like that. And that's always people worrying, well, if the government doesn't know, how are they going to be able to tax? There's always ways to, to be able to collect the appropriate, you know, you have different views on what the appropriate level of taxation should be. But but Bitcoin is not going to impact that. It just impacts who's the one controlling it. Mm -hmm. And I got you, I asked you a question that got us totally off of the migration issue and how it was going to have an impact on No, but those, those all do, that, 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 that does impact that. Obviously the economy growing and, and it's, but it's, um, you know, there's a lot of governments, people that were concerned about, oh, the internet in the early days, because it was gonna, right open up all these different things. And yeah, the countries that tried to restrict people from using the internet, just, they just fell behind. Right. And so it's gonna be the same way with, you know, I believe it was the same way with Bitcoin. There'll be countries that choose to restrict it. China has done that, there's been others, but they're gonna be the ones that kind of fall behind on this system. And there's countries like El Salvador that have embraced it because it, it puts them on, equal footing with the rest of the world now. This is a system that nobody controls. And we saw that recently with the US just basically invalidated all of Russia's bonds that they own. You know, regardless of how you feel about the war and those things, that has for both friends and foes of the US, these countries now are looking like, wow, if the US doesn't like something we do all of a sudden, they could just say all our savings are no longer valid because the US is the one that, that controls that. So I think for having a more just financial system, 
it is one that, that nobody controls, that has rules that are the same for everybody and levels the playing field. And so that's why I'm so excited to see the, the growth of, of Bitcoin because nobody controls it. Salvadorans are on the equal footing as, as Americans. But if nobody controls it, then who makes the rules? The, the rules are set in code. So, and they're, they're, set, right. they're set in code in a way that, that cannot be manipulated. I mean, it's, it's a longer conversation with the I'm way the sure, mining I'm happenings sure. I, and, and, and all of that, to, but it's, yeah. it's set up in a way so that the, the rules cannot be changed unless the vast overwhelming of people agree on those changes and for that to be implemented. But you're always going to have vested interests that are not going to want to change the rules that, that only benefit you know, one small subset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's versus the traditional system. They always change the rules to <laughs> whatever benefits them. Right. So and we've seen, you know, going back to some of the issues you were talking about before. And then and I don't know if you ever do contracts with them, so I won't put you on the spot. But one thing we've seen with with the way the IMF funds things is they come in, they give these huge loans to countries and basically put them into a form of debt servitude. They have, you know, these huge loans. A lot of times corrupt rulers are the ones that are signing for it because, you know, they're going to build a couple, you know, a dam or some roads, but they're also going to siphon a big portion off the top. And they know by the time the payments are due, they're going to be gone, you know, living in the Swiss Alps with their Swiss bank account. And so they don't have to worry about it. It'll be the people in the country that have to, to pay those. And so I think we've seen through the traditional system, this real neo-colonialism um, in El Salvador, but throughout the world where you see the IMF and these other organizations that the US government and the European Union control keep these countries kind of under their thumb. And I think Bitcoin allows them to escape from this system, a system that nobody controls the rules of, that everybody is on the same level. And that's why I think you're going to see more countries like El Salvador decide to go that direction. So uh, your, your podcast, yeah. uh, Bitcoin, and, and, and the, the issue of migration or immigration, um, and we are speaking specific, specifically about immigration to the U.S. Right? Yes. Um, what prompted you to to have this topic on this show? Because I think the immigration issue is one of the the biggest challenges facing El Salvador, and I see. I I would go out on a limb and predict in ten years from now you're not going to have an immigration issue. You're going to see net immigration actually into El Salvador. There will be more people coming in there than there will be people flowing out. And I think the way the current system is set up, even though, you know, obviously a big part of El Salvador's GDP is dependent on remittances from, mm -hmm. from immigrants, I actually think it overall has done a big dis... I, I think it's a net negative for the country. I think we've seen a brain drain, a drain of the most ambitious, hardworking people leaving El Salvador, and then a lot of family level dysfunction that comes with that. You know, obviously it's hard to have a healthy marriage when you don't see each other for several years. Um, so you see a lot of family breakdown, you see a lot of kids growing up without their parents. And so I think that immigration issue is going to be in some ways fixed by the adoption of Bitcoin. And I think once we see less immigration, I think you're going to see El Salvador overall on all that health metrics improve. And I, I'm not, I always think it's good to have some flow of people. Obviously, I'm an immigrant living in El Salvador. I think it's good to have that flow. But I think the current way it's happening um, between El Salvador and the US, I think it's a negative. And so for me, it's an important issue mm -hmm. that I think Bitcoin is going to help address. And you think it's a negative here and a negative there? I think it's a positive in the U.S., to be honest. I mean, I think it's, a, a, you know, there's always going to be some negative externalities. But mm -hmm. I think overall, I would say it's a positive in the U.S. I'm, I think 
it's good to have an expanding population. I think it's good to have a variety of, of backgrounds and people coming in. And I think the U.S. definitely is a net beneficiary of immigration. But I think the countries that are losing people have a net negative. So. I think we would agree there. Um, I, th I think it is a positive thing uh, for the United States to welcome immigrants. Um, and I think it is a very big negative for the countries that are losing people. Um, particularly El Salvador, because it is close to my heart. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely not a sustainable model to have your biggest export be your people. Right, right. So if Bitcoin were to be an element of, of comprehensive approach to immigration, where does the advocacy for, do, do you see this program as advocacy for that? Are you doing advocacy work? Or do you know of people who are doing advocacy work that are, are specifically on the immigration are, issue? Yeah, that or? are arguing that this this could have an impact on, I, on I mean, regular migration. I I have been very vocal at it. I'm sure they just ignore me, but I'm always tweeting at the U.S. Embassy about how <laughs> this is their main goal. You talk to people who work in the U.S. Embassy. This is their primary duty: is to reduce irregular immigration to the United States. That is their overwhelming goal in the U.S., I mean, in El Salvador, um, this embassy specifically. And I've argued with them many times that this is actually going to solve that issue to a big extent and that they should be supporting these initiatives rather than than criticizing them. That they, you know, and, and I don't want to get too much into the politics. I know that that Naive is a, is a controversial figure, but I think he's actually going to solve the issue for them that they haven't been able to solve in the last 40 years. I think it is, I think it is the, the issue right now. Um, I think there are a lot of geopolitical issues going on right now in El Salvador, particularly with the United States. Um, what, what's the response when, when you talk to the U.S. I Embassy about so so they came there was people from the embassy that came down here once the law was passed because they wanted to know what was going on it totally yeah. blindsided them um i think in general there is a a suspicion of bitcoin that it is one there's there's people at, at higher levels that are concerned that it is going to weaken and and possibly replace the, the U.S. dollar as the reserve currency. And so for them, they're, they see that as a negative for the U.S. dollar to lose its place as the global reserve currency. I disagree. Even as an American, I don't think it's a current, that it's a system that's, that's fair and just. And, and I think it would be good to see it go away. I think there's a lot of negatives that have come with, uh, you know, the U.S. petrodollar system and the way that, you know, it, it ties everything into the U.S.'s control. So I think they have some geopolitical concerns. I think there's just a lack of understanding more than anything. They don't know what Bitcoin is. And so they think it's money laundering and, you know, drug dealers and all of these things. And so they're um, suspicious of all of those things. They don't I think there's a disconnect for them. They don't realize that <clears throat> a lot of the things that the U.S. government has pushed on El Salvador, specifically around the banking system, have actually held the economy back because it creates all this friction. I mean, the, the AML KYC laws in El Salvador are crazy strict. I mean, I have a business in the U.S. I do stuff all the time with large, moving large amounts of money around. I never get asked questions. It's just normal. Here, I go to pay my kids tuition and I have to fill out a KYC AML form, you know, where I'm getting the money to pay my kids tuition. I did a long-term service contract on my car for $500 and, and I had to fill out. This creates friction and cost and makes businesses not want to do business here because they're like, it's impossible to deal with the banks here. And so Rather than doing a call center here or a support center here, we're going to go someplace where it's just easier to 
to work. And so it's those things that have actually come being pushed by the US government. And it didn't used to be like that. When I first moved here, it was very easy to work with the banks. It was very easy to open a bank account. And then the US, I think it was 2013 when they passed FACTA, it just locked everything up here and it became unbearable. It took me 11 years to get a bank account here. And then once I opened it, I used it once and I was like, oh my gosh, this is too much of a pain. I'm just going to keep my bank in the US and use the ATMs here. You know, now I can use Bitcoin, but it's um, so those are US caused issues. That's the US making it less attractive for people to do business in El Salvador, which means there's less jobs, which means there's more people leaving to the US. So I think we need to reverse that. We make El Salvador a friendly place to do business. It becomes a hub of finance. They just recently announced that um, Bitfinex is going to open up a global financial exchange based on Bitcoin here in El Salvador. And so they'll allow companies to, to raise money, uh, governments to raise money through bond offerings in an exchange that's much cheaper and easier than it is in the US. And so I think you're gonna see all of these opportunities come into this region. And it's not gonna happen overnight, but I think you're gonna see these kind of knock-on effects that are going to decrease the need or the desire for people to leave. I mean, wouldn't you agree that the overall people are more positive now than they were. And I'm not saying that, that that's directly because of Bitcoin, but wouldn't you say that the, the overall tone and the sentiment of the average people is much more positive about El Salvador now than it was a few years ago? I, I would absolutely say so, yeah. And, and it's one of those things where, um, you know, coming from a human rights background and uh, working in the nonprofit sector and particularly in, in impoverished and uh, marginalized communities. Um, I've been really surprised um, at the response of uh, the overall response of Salvadorans, particularly to the state of the exception. Yeah. Um, I, I'm 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 going to try not to go down a rabbit hole uh, on that. But I, I think as Americans, those are things we really. I mean, I struggle with that. I'm like. Well, yeah. But you talk to the people and they're and like, it's not, no, and, this and, is what and, we needed. And it's not my country. Yeah. So I try, I try really, uh, I really try to step back and say, well, um, you know, we, but I, but I also believe that there are hu universal human rights. So I, I yeah. do uh, have some real concerns and issues with what's happening here. But I also know that the people on the streets are genuinely, um, more positive for the most part. I'd say there are parts of the country that have been hit really hard with this. Um, and there are a lot of people who are suffering because of family members who've been swept up who are not uh, guilty of, of being associated with gangs. Um, and so I think, you know, I think there it's, it's another complex issue, isn't it? Because now we have this whole country of people who are very positive about where they are, where yeah. they live. Um, and maybe that seems like less of a cause unless you happen to be in the demographic that could easily be swept up and put in prison. Um, it's interesting on that because I know people even who have fam family members in that situation, but they still are in favor I have, of the I have overall. heard the same thing. I've heard the same thing. So I, you know, I think it's important for people to have a pride in their country. And yeah. I think there, there are some efforts going on right now, um, even funded by USAID, uh, that are, are specifically trying to increase um, pride in the country. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that there are a lot of solutions um, to the migration situation and the particularly irregular migration situation. But like you said, you and I both are immigrants in a country uh, that allowed us to do that without a whole lot of hassle. Yeah, much really. easier yeah, than any Salvadoran easier. to come to the U.S. for right, sure. Right, right. So, so what's the drawback for the United States uh, to increase the number of immigrants and the, the kinds of people who can come to the United States 
Um, what's what's the big drawback? Why do you think it should be easier? Why do you think it is so much easier for for us to come here um, than it is for us on the whole to to open the doors and say welcome? Um, I mean, I think part of it's just a practical level. You can you're not going to have a rush of Americans coming to El Salvador to mm -hmm. to want to to live, and so that's why you see. You know, it, it, the restrictions and the the level of hoops you have to jump through are correspondent with with that. That doesn't mean that it's fair, but that's that's the reality. It's uh, so I think I, I have I have what I think would be the solution. So I'll, tell I'll, me, I'll, I want to uh, know. I want to know. I'll, I'll lay solution. it on you and uh, see what you think. I think rather than the the complicated process of people trying to get a visa to the US that people go through. I think it should be a straightforward, like one day screening and then charge them $12,000 for that to come in. And that will go towards making sure they have health insurance while they're there and covering any other costs that they have. And rather than them paying the coyotes that $12,000 to be snuck into the U.S., they do it legally. They pay that fee. It guarantees that they have health care so that they're not a burden on that system. And then they know that they, you know, if they break the laws or have any issues, that they will, will lose that. But they have some skin in the game, but they've done it legally. Automatic work visa? Automatic work visa. And people will say, oh, well, the people are poor. They can't afford that. They find a way to get the coyotes to finance that now. So they will. Some people do. The majority. I mean, I know people here all the time that I don't know where they get it from, but I know what they pay and they, they, they make it happen. A lot of times they're sending money back once they get there. And it creates all these other human trafficking issues on top of that. So I think we should just bypass that, that. They cut out the traffickers, that they charge a high fee, but like I said, comes with health care, things that a lot of times they're accessing anyways once they get there, but is done in a more um, economical way. And then they know that they've paid to be there legally and they're going to make their money and stay the amount of time that, that's advantageous to them and then come back. And they can travel back and forth. And so then the people who are truly desperate and can't pay a coyote and, you know, walk and ride the tops of trains to get there. Well, yeah. then there's the there's the existing they're going to do the same thing that, they, that they've always done. But I mean, the, I mean, I know a lot of people who've gone to the U.S. and I would say 95 percent of them use a coyote to go especially from El Salvador. Hardly anybody goes on their own and and they find a way to, to pay for it. So instead of that, then you take away you take away the argument that they're a burden on the system. I think most of them would be happy to pay that rather than have to take that grueling, you know, pay the same amount, take a grueling trip. Instead, they can get on a plane and show up and you know, pay their fee and know they have health care and be not living in the shadows. That's my solution. Well, I think I think coming up with solutions is the only way that we're going to you know, we're going to we're going to have to spitball a lot of solutions before uh, we come to the, the absolute right one. But I, I think it's important for people to be open to new ways of thinking. Uh, like you said, some people thought the internet was going to be the, the end. Uh, and some people think Bitcoin is, you know, the devil. Um, I don't think that. I think that, uh, I think it's something new. Um, and it's going to take a while for people to open their minds to it. And it's going to take, you know, a lot of education and capacity building and I'd like to see, I'd like to see something uh, in El Salvador, whether it's Bitcoin or some brilliant, you know, uh, development project that gives people the the means to thrive here. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I'm I'm open to to rolling with it. I think um, you know the mi migration issue is incredibly complicated and complex, and I think now we're seeing people traveling from other places, Venezuela, Nicaragua, and and they're going to start coming to places like El Salvador too. Immigration has always been an issue. Uh, it, well, not always, maybe, but for a long time, yeah, it's been an issue, and you see it not just in the United States, but you know, in Europe and in Costa Rica, um, any place where there's a, a thriving economy or a more thriving economy um, and better conditions, yeah, people are going to want to be um, creating the conditions on the ground here for people to be able to thrive um, and to rise above the poverty levels that exist, which are extreme in many cases, um, will bring down irregular immigration. And there's um, there's really no, I mean, I'm very positive on the future of El Salvador. I, I think it has so many things going for it. And, and culturally, the people are very hardworking and industrious, and so, I think it's um, kind of telling that there has been so much poverty despite this, you know, work ethic here. It shows just the the impact of the wars and the other external factors have had. But I think going forward, we're going to see a lot of those things really harnessed in this. I mean, I, I think El Salvador is going to outshine Panama and Costa Rica 10, 15 years from now. I think people are very much underestimating the um, how revolutionary the the things that they're embarking, you know, on are. I, I know most people will be skeptic of that, skeptical of that, but that's that's where I see it going. Um, I have a lot of hope for El Salvador. Um, I wouldn't be here if I didn't. Yeah. Uh, and I think a lot of times people come at uh, people people come at issues like immigration um, from very different seats in the stadium, but they're all going for the same end. Yeah. Uh, the same win. Um, I think we're actually, I think the real, the next issue we're going to face here is I think there is going to be internally in El Salvador, a lot of discussions and different views on people immigrating into El Salvador. I think we I think there will be a backlash. There's always a backlash anywhere when, when there's an influx of people from the outside. And I get DMs and messages from people every day that are coming from Australia, Europe, you know, Hong Kong, people from around the world that are moving to El Salvador. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed that at all in, in the circles that, that you run in and in San Salvador, but definitely here I'm, I'm shocked at the number of people that are see El Salvador as having more opportunity and uh, potential than you know the places that Salvadorans have historically fleed to. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to be a new problem for El Salvador to grapple with. I think it could be too. Um, I, I'm always shocked at the number of people. I have a question for you about yeah. about expats. Why are we expats and? Not immigrants. Well, I mean, you, obviously you can have, uh, there's there's different takes on that. But I think the, the rule of thumb is if you are living in a place and your salary is higher than the local people, you're an expat. If you are living in a place and your salary is lower than the local people, you're an immigrant. I mean, that's the, the I know that's not politically correct, but that's, People who qual qualify themselves as immigrants or expats, that pretty much fits across the board. Okay. I like to think of myself as an immigrant. I like to think of myself as a refugee. So a but refugee. people get mad about that also. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh. No, we have lots of people coming from places around the world that are coming as refugees. I mean, people, because they have money and they have ability to travel, People get mad when I call them that, but they will tell you they were 
leaving because they felt persecuted for their health choices or different things in the countries that they're coming from. And so they're seeing El Salvador as a place to come as a refugee. Um, you know, people, people get prickly when you say that about people who are white and have money, but it just depends on your definitions of things. And who can just show up somewhere and not stay 10 years in a refugee yep. camp. No, hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's, um, I think, I think there's going to be some interesting dynamics that take place. I think we saw a little bit of that during during COVID. I don't know if you experienced that at all, but it was the the first time I felt like I experienced any racism um, or xenophobia in El Salvador as people would walk to the other side of the street and you're a white person walking down the street because there was this sense that it was the white people that were bringing COVID in from around the world. So uh, it was, uh, it was, yeah, it was, it's like, wow, I'm not used to feeling that. So it was, uh, I think it was good. It was eye opening to, for me yeah. to, to, and obviously not comparing that to, you know, the lifelong persecution that some people feel, but it was, it was kind of interesting to see that and the, mm -hmm. and the, how upset people were when people were sneaking into the country illegally during that time. I was right. seeing people comment on Facebook, they should shoot them if they're coming in illegally. <laughs> I was like, oh man, this is uh, ironic. Uh, uh, you know, a country of that sends out people every year and now um, the people are very upset when people were coming in illegally. And so, mm -hmm. but I just think that speaks to when we, when we're motivated by, by fear and misunderstanding that, that we can act stupidly sometimes. And so, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's a, a universal thing. And I think that's going to be a good problem for El Salvador to grapple with. How do they integrate in all the, the people that want to be part of here? And that I think they're going to be bringing resources and jobs. And, um, you know, for every person that comes in, there'll be lots of jobs they bring. But there'll be people saying, no, they shouldn't be employed here. They should hire a Salvadoran to do that, even though a lot of times there won't be somebody qualified for that and it's but they're going to have to kind of fight through that whole argument is immigration beneficial or is it taking jobs from the local people and it's just mm -hmm. going to be from a different but but that's a much better problem to have than the the one of all your people wanting to leave the country so yeah absolutely so. um well i appreciate your time this has been fun it has been a fun conversation i I enjoyed learning a little bit more about Bitcoin and your philosophy about how it can help reduce irregular migration. I think, I think there, I think every idea has has value, and so I've enjoyed that. Um, and hearing your perspective, I, um, I wish, I wish it was, I wish it was an easier solution, um, and I wish I had, uh, you know more insight on what the specifics are that that it will take i think it's going to take development investment i think it's going to take uh orderly processes and and policies um i think it's going to take people being more open to innovation and change um but in the long run you're right i think el salvador will be better off when fewer people are leaving Definitely. so thanks for thanks yeah. for giving me the opportunity to are you chat. on twitter or instagram or anywhere else people can follow you if you they want to i i yeah i'm not i'm not a i'm not a big social okay. media person i know that's like one of my deficits right now but you can look on my uh website www.chispa-strategies.com um and See for, for companies, doing, there's a lot yeah. of companies that are relocating here that Absolutely. I don't know exactly what type of consulting services you provide, but they're going to be looking for people like yourself. So who, who know that who, who know El Salvador? Yes. Inside and out yes. Now so tell them what kind of services years, so. you could provide. Yeah, I provide strategy, uh, strategy, project, program development. Um, I work on culture. Uh, which I think is extremely important right now with so many companies coming in from outside of the country uh, to work within another culture. And hugely help, important, yes, hugely, hugely important. important. So to help 
uh, people navigate not just the systems, but the culture yeah. itself um, and learn how to uh, what I what I'm working on right now is is developing ways to help companies and organizations take the take the what's best about El Salvadoran culture uh, and and mesh that or in, integrate that with the good things that we all bring uh, to the table, like, you know, depending on the business or yeah, the company, yeah. efficiencies that we often don't see in some of the, the Salvadoran systems, um, efficiencies, effectiveness, leadership skills, capacity building, empowerment, those sorts of things. And enmesh that with what's really positive about Salvadoran culture. And there's a lot to be said for Salvadoran culture. That's why we're here. No, um, definitely. That's, yeah, that's yeah. The, so the thing it's that... so for companies coming in that are looking to navigate the the system and the culture here, um, and think through strategies about how best to have an impact, um, particularly if it's a social impact that is positive for people here in El Salvador. I would be happy to to pick up. The phone so any the any quick tips for people that are struggling with the, the top down dynamic and and getting employees to kind of take take not be afraid to take initiative and to, to play that role? I mean, how do you advise companies? I, well, to... I think people really have to be ready to dig in and do some hard work yeah. um, because it takes a lot of humbling oneself as a, as a leader um, to become a member of the team um, and hear the voices around the table and give them, give them space to help drive the future of a company um, people have good ideas yeah and oh, yeah if you surround yourself with people who are enthusiastic and confident and willing to to take some risks and willing to take some initiative um it has to be encouraged i'm finding um or i have well that's the thing the i've years. run it into be, sometimes when you try to, to st structure that um, there's it confuses people because be they're used to this top down and they're like what do you mean? Yeah, um, but it can be done. And, yeah. I, and I've worked in projects where, you know, we've we've seen a lot of change and it comes from actually uh, accompanying and walking alongside people and not just saying, here's the rule book, follow it. Yeah. You know, let them help make the rules. Awesome. Or so did we put your invite them to help make the rules? Did we put your website up? Do you have a website or uh, is there the they just search for you? Is, I think it was. Do we have that, Andy? This is all on my website. Okay. So, uh, I don't know if we have the URL that we can pop up there, or what's the? Where can people search to find the? Uh, it's chispa-strategies.com. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So. Well, I'm glad we were able to solve this whole immigration issue tonight, and. Yeah. Uh, I think I think I think we'd need a few more rounds, a few more people around the table, and some uh, some serious yeah. seri serious will to 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 duke it out, maybe. Well, my my <laughs> hope is that it it solves itself as uh, as El Salvador continues to grow, and and you know they can uh, be a beacon for their neighbors to to show them. So that's yeah. uh, that's my optimistic. Uh, prediction. Well, we keep working at it. Yeah. All right. Well, it's great having you here tonight. Thanks. It's great to be here.